three, two, one. All right, what's going on everyone? Jared Couture here from Kung Fu Music Lessons and Two Cities, One World. I'm here with the great Dean Brown today. Uh, Dean is uh, an amazing musician. I'll have him tell you from his perspective, but uh, I met him at Musicians Institute, I think seven years ago. I took every class Dean had to offer and went to almost every OC <laughs> and continued lessons um, because he has so much gold in there, just so much. So. Thanks so much, Dean, for being here. Oh, I'm so happy to do it. Thank you. So cool, man. First question or first thing, I just want uh, from your perspective, from your words, could you just uh, tell everyone a little bit about your musical background, when you started and kind of the progression until now? In um, sure. I mean, uh, well, you know, I started playing guitar, I guess, kind of late. I was, uh, I guess, around 12. You know something like that. I mean, in my mind, that's late because I, I, you know, I see little kids three and four years old playing violin, like, you know, playing Paganini and stuff. So, you know, so, uh, so I think 12, but, you know, I think part of that is because guitar is, at least from my perspective, when I was a kid, like in the 60s, it was uh, that, that instrument was more tethered to popular music. You know, so it was like when you became interested in popular music, like in music in general, like you kind of switched from from whatever type of ball you were playing with to a guitar. Um, it it was uh, it was because music became came into your your universe as a not something that somebody made you do, but something that you just like, you know, like the Beach Boys or, 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 or whatever, or the Beatles or something like that. And so they played guitars. And so it was like, oh, that guitar seems cool. You know, it's, you know that, that, that was more of the uh, inspiration for a lot of people as opposed to the kind of thing where, you know, well, you need to get more culture, so you need to learn a musical instrument, you know? And so here, you know, play the piano or the bugle or whatever. And um, uh, so anyway, round 12, uh, I started playing uh, um, it, and I started focusing really a lot more on guitar when I heard this this record um, called Are You Experienced by uh, Jimi Hendrix. And um, I remember vividly uh, a poster when I was a kid. Uh, I was living uh, in the DC area. My dad was in Vietnam at the time. And, uh, and there were these posters around that just said, Jimi Hendrix, are you experienced? It didn't say what it was. It didn't say it was like a musical concert or anything like that. And so, uh, uh, you know, it, it was this kind of mystical thing that we had everybody kind of, you know, just had to figure out, like, what what is that, you know? And so I bought this record and I was just, mesmerized I didn't understand it at first it was like nothing I'd ever heard and it, and I liked it way more than anything else that I had heard up to that time and so I uh, I proceeded to figure out everything on it right and then uh, a friend of mine who actually played guitar uh, or quote unquote played guitar you know he, he knew more uh, um, he told me that I had the guitar tuned wrong. And so now all the stuff I learned, you know, I just had to like throw in the garbage. I could, you know, I, it wasn't, you know, obviously I, I, I got a little bit of, uh, of right hand or, or, a, you know, uh, plectrum kind of technique from that. But, uh, but all the left hand stuff was just useless, you know, because it was and not useless, you know, obviously still got to press strings and do stuff but it was pretty frustrating and i quit playing for a, for quite a few months you know because i was so pissed off you know oh, that man. uh you know and i wish at the end of the day in retrospect but you know hindsight's 2020 but uh, i wish i could remember what that tuning was because it know? worked it worked i could you know what i mean like a, it sounded right like the stuff sounded right and uh 
And so consequently, uh, uh, or subsequently, I, I, I learned this stuff again, but not quite to the same depth of peeling back the onion that I had done when, uh, Wow. I had it in this weird tuning. You know? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so right after that, uh, my uh, my parents, as I told you, my father was in the army. So we uh, he he had come back from Vietnam, and uh, and so I'm now really into music, you know. And I've, I've got a band, a little band, and we're playing, you know gig here and there and stuff and and then all of a sudden he says hey we're uh i've been uh, i've been stationed in korea and we're all going and i didn't even know where korea was you know so and i it was a kind of a panic situation because uh because i was like i'm in the center you know of where i need to be it's like with music i was on the east coast i was actually at that time we were living in uh in massachusetts and it you know, you, there was so much going on, you know, um, Woodstock and all kinds of stuff going on. And now all of a sudden, um, I'm leaving it for like, just in my mind, something, something that uh, like where there's not even electricity. That's the way I thought, you know, that's what, and, uh, and sure enough, when we landed, uh, in Korea, uh, we had to go through this little quarantine thing, and um, and then we uh, got on this bus to drive from the military airport to uh, where we were going to be staying. And during that ride, all I saw was like grass huts and stuff. So I'm thinking, like my my worst fears is that man, there's no electricity here, you know. <laughs> and, oh, and it's, so uh, but it's so stupid but I mean it was just you know I'm, I'm at that time I was uh, like 14 or, or 15 something like that 14 I think and um, and then finally we got to uh, you know the uh, the base that or the, the military uh, uh, base that we were uh, going to be living at and I immediately decided to just go out to the teen club and just see if there were like anybody there that, that you know uh, 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 had any kind of interest in music or whatever and uh, sure enough when I walk in the door there was a band playing like uh, this this teenage you know teen group um, uh, and they were playing popular songs that were a little bit dated, but they were, but they were, I knew them, you know what I mean? And, they were like, and so I sat in with them and I ended up uh, kind of like taking over, the, you know how I am, you know, I just kind of, <laughs> I just took it over. And, uh, and, and we ended up um, in that situation, we ended up uh, playing uh, this Korean agent heard us play a gig like at an NCO club where it's a non-commissioned officers club there were different you know there's like a caste system in the army you know there's like the officers club and the NCO club and the EM club and uh, and you're not none of those people if you're a certain rank you're not allowed to go to the other ones but I could go because I was playing but uh, um, anyway this guy heard us play and offered us uh, the opportunity to play seven nights a week at a club in downtown Seoul. Wow. And so we did it, you know, and, uh, uh, and I did that for a year and a half with no breaks. Oh my God. And we, so I've never worked as much since, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was an amazing experience and, you know, and talk about paying dues and like you know constantly having to learn um repertoire and one of the th things that made us uh, very popular at that time uh, this would have been uh i guess 1970 71 in there something uh was that we actually played uh besides playing you know rock and, and soul and pop songs from the day uh we also played 
Korean pop music. This is like way before K-pop, obviously. Right. But uh, but but That's I guess right. it was it was a like a the you know the oh my the, you could know, be leading the K-pop class the of the prehistoric <laughs> K-pop and uh, and so we were so we did that and that we got so famous that I mean it was unbelievable. I you know I had a bodyguard and uh, you know a chauffeur and we had a, a like a. a a fan club and then it was crazy it was just crazy moved back to the united states after that experience um and uh i remember um uh stopping off on the way we were headed back to the east coast but i stopped off in california and uh i was staying with a friend uh in uh monterey i guess or uh, um it was actually Fort Ord or something like that. And um, near there was Car Carmel. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, that's kind of famous for the play Misty for me, that movie where Clint Eastwood almost gets killed by some fan or something. Anyway, but Carmel's are like this, you know, really nice city on the West Coast, uh, up north, you know, Bay Area. And, um, uh, there was a music store and in that music store on Sundays they had a jam session so now you know I've been like the, the big fish in this in this not so little sea in Korea and sort of uh, in uh, you know Japan Korea because we played all over the place um, and so I figure I'm gonna go into this jam session and show everybody how it's done you know and I go in there and the first three people that played before me just like blew me away. Like, like, I, I, like I, it was like so far beyond what I was capable of as a guitarist, you know? And, I, and it, was, uh, it was like a, a, a wake up call, you know, to say, oh, welcome back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, not to say that there weren't some great musicians in Korea, because there were. You know, there was a lot of GIs, you know, and I learned a lot. Matter of fact, that's where I kind of got my, uh, um, had my path sort of changed from uh, uh, just sort of thinking about rock and, and soul and, and R&B uh, to jazz. And because they turned me on to uh, two records and specifically, one was a record called uh, well, not so much the records, but these were the records that I remember. One was uh, uh, Coltrane. The name of the record is Coltrane. It's on Impulse. And uh, it's a blue cover. It's my favorite, still to this day, my favorite Coltrane record. And um, and then there was this other record by, uh, by West Montgomery called Smoking at the Half Note, very famous uh, record. And... Uh, and so those two records kind of took me on a journey down, you know, down this jazz avenue. Even though when I listened to them, I didn't even know what it was. I, I, what I was, I was listening to. As a matter of fact, um, when they were improvising, it was so alien to me that I didn't even realize that they were soloing over a form. It just sounded amazing, and I didn't, I, you know. I, uh, um, I was, it seemed insurmountable at the time, you know, it seemed like, wow, this is just too much. And, but I did take elements of it and try to use it, you know, fit, you know, without sort of really doing a deep dive, you know, um, for me, it was just something I, I enjoyed listening to. It was like listening to classical music, but not really aspiring to be a classical guitarist. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, so I kind of came to jazz through the side door, in, in, you know, and uh, I think it, uh, in the rock and, and blues and soul thing, I think really, really informed my playing uh, when I play in a jazz context, which kind of, I mean, you know, I think gives me uh, a voice. And that's the kind, you know, that's the whole thing that you're trying to search for as a musician, right? You're 
you you want to find your voice so that uh, so that you're able to tell stories to people. That's the whole you know that's the whole game, right? Is to is to try to be able to communicate uh, various things to people, whether it be lyrically or or just instrumentally, on uh, in terms of emotions and and uh, uh, um, information in general. You know. So anyway, um, I went to uh, after that. I uh, I decided I. Uh, I took a semester off from school. I went to uh, college uh, in DC at first. Uh, I was at George Washington University, <clears throat> and I couldn't study music because I didn't have a classical repertoire. So I uh, uh, decided to be a musicology major, so at least I could take music courses. You know, like uh, hmm. theory and um, uh, and harmony and blah 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 blah, and different uh, uh, ear training, all, all all the different you know requisite courses that you would have to take to get a degree in whatever in music. Um, but it wasn't me, man. You know, it wasn't me. You know, to uh, you know to uh, even though obviously I learned a, I learned a lot, but I. You know, I didn't do well in that. I, I didn't thrive in that environment. My grades weren't good. You know, uh, I just wasn't inspired. Um, so I uh, I took a semester off and went up to play with a with an R and B band uh, in Massachusetts that was uh, led by uh, a guy that was in the had been in the army, a sax player, a really good jazz blues sax player um, that was in the Eighth Army Band and he had formed this group up in uh, in uh, Western Massachusetts and uh, three horns uh, you know uh, keyboards guitar percussion and drums and bass you know so it was the you know and, uh, and we played music you know anything from you know Junior Walker to uh, to like uh, Cold Blood, you ever heard of that band? They had a famous singer named Lydia Pence. It's Bay Area kind of thing, sort of like Tower of Power. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, sort of at this, maybe even earlier than Tower of Power, maybe not, and some, some, but way back there, you know? Anyway, uh, I decided to go to Berkeley. And I, um, I spent, uh, five semesters at Berkeley. I graduated um, from there. Um, and, you know, there's this, um, everybody that goes to Berkeley, we have this sort of, there's this, this sort of rite of passage is that you've got a gig before you graduated. So that it was, it was like a, it was like a badge of honor to not graduate because you got you got a gig and you got you know hired by somebody you know you know internationally known but i graduated but i always tell people it's like yeah but but i graduated in five semesters and they say it's it still counts you know <laughs> it's like uh you know it's like you're you know you can't graduate and get this sort of uh you know the badge of honor that says you didn't graduate before you got a gig, but it but it didn't matter anyway. Uh, I I was playing with um, with uh, you know a lot of different groups up there and and doing some odd jobs even just to try to pay rent, you know. Um, uh, and uh, I wound up getting a gig with uh, this guy named Tiger Okoshi, an incredible trumpet player, incredible educator, incredible writer. And a lot of people played with him. He was, he was kind of like, I, I don't want to uh, say this to disparage either name, but uh, he was kind of like the Miles Davis of Boston. But he was, you know, he was his own thing. You know, the fact that he played trumpet and the fact that everybody wanted to be in his band is what I'm referring to when I say the, uh, the sort of Miles Davis reference. And um, so the original guitar player in his band was a guy named Bill Frizzell. 
and I'm sure your your listeners probably know who that is, right? The second guitar player in his band was a guy named Mike Stern. Wow. And so I think your listeners probably know that guy too. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> and then the third uh, the third guitar player was yours truly. And so uh, uh, so it was good lineage. You know what I mean? And it was a a great uh, um, way for me to sort of really um, develop my voice to kind of get known by the by the Boston community, you know, like uh, everybody who played with Tiger, you know, and um, then the the uh, vicarious benefit is that now your name starts getting around without you promoting it. It's happening organically. And uh, I moved to New York uh, around 1978, 79, somewhere in there, uh, into Manhattan, because I figured I gotta be in the belly of the beast if I'm gonna, you know. And not long after I moved there, I got the gig uh, with Billy Cobham and ended up playing with Billy Cobham up until a couple of years ago, on and off, you know. And through that gig, I ended up playing with, uh, uh, I was the original guitar player in Steve Smith's Vital Information. And um, then I played with uh, Bob James, and there was a saxophonist in Bob James's band named Kirk Whalum, and, uh, and famous, very, you know, wonderful career, both in the, the jazz world and in the gospel world, you know, uh, Kirk. And through them, uh, I, I got introduced to uh, Marcus Miller and also David Sanborn. So I was playing in those groups. And also, just from the New York scene, I, uh, I met Mike and Randy Brecker. And uh, George Witte, the keyboard player that was playing with uh, Mike and Randy, um, before he was playing with Mike and Randy, he was playing in my band on Long Island. And so he recommended me for that. You see what I mean? It's all, it, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people, uh, think that, uh, you have to kind of beat people over the head with you, with who you are, you know? And I, I, I you know, at the end of the day, I think the best thing you can do is just play as good as you can play and just make sure that every time you play you treat it like it's the last time you're going to play even when you're practicing you know and then uh um then you'll be prepared if the, if luck happens to you know knock on your door um and i think you know in my opinion that's the most surefire way of of uh, becoming more successful and getting uh, and then of course you have to now when you get to the other side of the business where you you know where it's you know you're writing for commercial type things like television there you have to you've got to you know kind of put on a different hat but if it's just about you uh, um, getting known to play you know it, that, that's a word of mouth thing. Yeah, I had a degree in composition from Berkeley, right? But uh, I never showed it to anybody <laughs> to get a gig because it wouldn't have mattered. Although I did need it at MI, not not to uh, to be able to teach there because they asked me to teach at, at MI, and, and we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. But uh, they asked me to teach at MI. Um, uh, sort of as a kind of a special kind of situation, not teaching. I wasn't teaching any, as you know, any core classes, just electives and uh, and uh, basically just electives and OC and and, and maybe a, a private lesson here and there. Um, that was the that was the sort of thing. Anyway, so that's um, 
you know, throughout all this, like I said, even from since I was 13, I always had my own bands. Always. Because I, you know, I always, whether I was right or wrong, I always had a way that I, I heard things and I knew that I couldn't and I didn't really want to uh, do it somebody else's way. <laughs> so I figured the best way to, to deal with that is to make sure, you know, just, just to have my own group and, and sort of treat those groups like benevolent dictatorships where I, where it's like, <laughs> you know, where, where, you know, I, I'm, I encourage people to bring in music, you know, and, and play their stuff. And, and I encourage people to, 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 um, bring their creativity and their um, opinions and all that, but at the end of the day, the kind of final. A lot of musicians really decision. don't care. They just want their money, and they, you know, they're coming for the gig and they're out. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's sometimes that's that. Yeah, and I think that's true. I think that's true to a certain degree. But I mean, uh, you know, there's a difference between a, a you know a, a, a working musician and an artist. Yes. You know. So anyway, I mean. I think that's kind of an, in a nutshell, you know, my uh, my uh, career, you know. But, right on. And you've been doing uh, some amazing things though, lately in the past, maybe ten years or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, lot of, lot of recording and uh, uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of gigs. Is, you know, especially with my own. I think, I think since. Uh, I want to say since 2001, you know, I've, I've really um, done a hell of a lot more touring under my own name, you know, and not only touring, but recording and sort of just all the vicarious things that go along with with uh, being recognized as an as a as as an artist as opposed to a like a, a side man or whatever. Yeah, I love it. You're such an amazing, I mean, like your, your songs are so good, you know, so oh, definitely, it's, it's definitely good that, you know, to have you as your own, <laughs> as your own band, of course. Now, listen, listen, I, I don't, <clears throat> go up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still to this day, I'm still a student, you know, and I'm not, a, you know, I listen to like YouTubes and, and Instagram and stuff and I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for stuff all the time, you know, to steal. Yeah. You know, because that's, you know, if you're not doing that, if you're not expanding your lexicon, and it's not like you can learn everything. It's, that's never what it's, what it's about. It's always been about um, you hear something, and it, if it moves you, you, you owe it to yourself to figure out what that is, because then you can, if that moves you, then if you learn it, you can probably move somebody else with it because it came to you came to you to it came through your heart as opposed to coming through your sort of intellect you know and so that's a you know that's an important thing it, it's so much uh, easier to to uh to tell a story that you believe than one that you're just reading you know yeah that's awesome well, cool, man. Thanks for all that. So I want to ask you, so, so of course, um, this is for the Kung Fu music lesson stuff. So uh, in general, I think I've told you a bit about it, but Kung Fu music lessons, essentially what I'm doing is I'm modeling um, Shaolin monks and the, the way that they're learning Kung Fu and the way that this has been happening and just applying this, uh, this to learning music. And essentially, Kung Fu just translates to mastery through time and effort. It doesn't mean martial arts. So you can have Kung Fu in anything. And But at the Shaolin Temple, uh, my Shifu, because I do take a Shaolin uh, Kung Fu with a monk, with a Shaolin monk. He's a good friend of mine now. He lives here. He grew up there from 5 to 20. And he said that every single day, um, basically seven days a week, they train a minimum of eight hours a day. Two, uh, four sets of two hours. But they're also just in the mountains and they don't even have, they don't have so much responsibilities. Like there's a cook, they don't have to cook their food. You know, basically they train all day and when they're done training, they're still training because well, of course, you know, some of them do love it and only, you know, want to do that. Um, but the point is they're getting a minimum of eight hours a day and they do that, you know, just like my guy for at least 15 years, you do that. And he, he left early. 
Some people stay their whole life. And so the idea is, you know, mastery through time and effort. It's about being the master, being the student, always being the student, but always, like you said, like just digging in, no matter, you're still just digging into new stuff constantly. Yeah. So, so I take this approach and I just work on myself and love the music and I try to balance it with like warming up on specifics daily because it's about mastering the foundation to where you don't have to think. And then like a little bit of that and then play at least 50-50. You know, but ideally more play, practice playing. But either way, I still have a, a routine every day, and no, even when I don't want to. So that's you the idea. Did. You always was, did. So, so you were you were made to uh, to sort <laughs> yeah. of, to to like. You were made for the type of discipline that you're referring to, you know, because even before you were into that, because I I I think I met you before that, right? Well, when I met you at MI, I was I was in there. I was literally trying to play ten hours every day. Cause... No, but I mean, but but you but you weren't doing the sort of Eastern discipline at that point, right? Oh, I'd been meditating for for years before that already, actually. Oh, okay, all right. Um, then maybe that's why. You know, I, I was always in it. I was always taking lessons from the best teachers I could find. I, I paid for all my lessons. I went to the best the, from the very beginning. That's why I went to MI too. I actually watched a lot of your videos before going, and I was like, I want to learn from that guy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, for... <laughs> okay. But I mean, that, I think that you know, it's an interesting thing because uh, you mentioned that 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 time reference of eight hours and uh you've probably heard me say this a million times to people you know um it's like because we think of eight hours in in western terms right uh as as the work day right right it's an eight hour day you put in an eight hour day right that's just that's that's like ground zero you know so um uh so I always ask, uh, not just students, but people in general, and I'm just saying, listen, um, if, you know, I, but if I ask a musician, I go, hey, so is this something that you want to do, like for a living? You know, this is, uh, is this your goal to be a, a professional musician, you know? And, uh, and everybody raises their hand, of course, you know? Of course, yeah, that's what I want to do. You know, that's why I got this nose ring. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, anyway, um, uh, the then I say, well, think of this: if you if you get out of school and you don't have any gigs or anything, and so you got to eat and you got to and you got to live somewhere, right? So, so you get a job working at like uh, um, you know I don't know uh, Burger King or or something like that or you know could be it could be anything or being a um, Amazon delivery guy you know which is maybe might be really cool I don't know I mean it, I'm sure some people love it you know um, but I'm saying you're doing it as a uh, you know as a means to an end, not because it's this is your life's aspiration, right? So you do you got to work like eight hours a day at, at a job like that in order to make enough money to uh, you know to eat and and have a roof over your head and blah blah blah, right? But most musicians I know spend that amount of time, like you said, honing their craft. So if you're not, you know, people say they want to be a professional, but they're not willing, especially early in their development to put in the amount of time that they would put in working at a job they hate, you know, to do something that they actually profess to love, you know, <laughs> then maybe that's not the right, you know, choice for you to be making you know and so i think um uh keeping us perspective like you're saying is a uh, um uh, you know is to make sure that if you really want to be good at something you know you have to you have to be focused mm -hmm. you know you have to be focused uh, you can't there's very it's extremely rare that there's this just sort of uh 
uh, uh, prodigious kind of uh, uh, experience where you, you know, the, you know, as soon as you get the diapers off, all of a sudden your kid can play like you know Rachmaninoff or something, you know. But it happens because it's just you know they, they got a big brain, you know. And if you got a big brain, then that happens. But you know most. Most musicians are pretty smart. They're pretty intelligent, but I wouldn't say where they're all geniuses. They're just some work harder than others, and and there's a you know uh, like I said at the end of the day, it's not it's not how much uh, you know. It's just how well you're able to 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 tell a story. You know when you when you play and 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 communicate. I don't necessarily think you have to be a genius to do that, but you do have to. Uh, you owe it to the craft to uh, to to focus and spend, like you say, uh, eight hours. Any time, every day, you know. Really, it's just about like a commitment, you know. Yeah. Kind of. But anyway. Yeah. But um. Um, yeah, man. So I have uh, another question. So for basic mastery thing again. So it's like a two-part question. Is one is what? How do you, in your words, define mastery? Like, what is that to you? And then, who are some of your favorite musical masters, or who do you who do you consider like some top, you know, true master musicians? Oh man, there's so many. I know there's so many. You know, there's so, that's what I mean. It's a it's a that. Um, you know, it's a very small community in music. Until you ask a question like that, <laughs> you know, and then because really, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, what you know, if you if I named a thousand guys and and girls, uh, I would. Uh, there's a billion people on Earth, right? You know, or, or, or like, what is there, three billion people on Earth, or something eight. like. Eight, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we're killing for going up. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, so, uh, so the idea that I could, you know, come up with a thousand names that are masters is still a drop in the bucket in terms of of probably how many musicians there are. You know, so let's just keep that perspective. But anyway, let's go back to what mastery is, um, and. Uh, I think uh, at at a at its uh, sort of least common denominator, mastery again is the ability. Um, in in when I say mastery in terms of music, is the ability to. Uh, to tell a story without being um, uh, encumbered by technical uh, or uh, emotional problems, and that's—I I, mean—that sounds kind of abstract, but uh, but the idea is if you've mastered your lexicon to the degree where you're capable of would you consider bb king a master i, I would you know yes. <clears throat> and so but you wouldn't ask bb king to play giant steps right you know what i mean because that's not part of his uh his, you know his universe really Although, you know, don't put it past. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because, uh, <laughs> because it, you know, he just didn't choose to go there. Right. You know, but he found a voice and found a way to master that particular uh, uh, area to the degree that he was capable of telling a great story without being uh, limited 
by his technique or by um, being uh, distracted by um, his uh, knowledge. You know, you don't want to be distracted by your knowledge, you know, because that that's that's kind of noise that's that's taking away from your ability to to uh, to just focus on on the task at hand, which is just kind of the next note, you know. Um, I always talk to people about the immediate future, like trying to imagine and manifest the immediate future. That to me is what improvising is, and and so there. Are, the people that do that the best, I consider to be masters. You know, and I'm I'm talking about, you know, the realm of playing guitar as an improviser. So that you know, obviously there would be a lot of different uh, uh, areas of areas of mastery. There, there, you know, there's certain guys that are great improvisers that are not great composers. And certain guys that are great composers that are not great improvisers. And there's certain guys that are both. You know. And stuff like that. You see what I'm saying? Um, so anyway, so th enough about that. That's that's um, you know, it's kind of a subjective answer, right? Yeah. I don't think uh, I'm sure you've asked this to other people, and they've probably done, you know stumbled like just it's the fun I part. Did. But you know, funny enough, <laughs> is, uh, Casper yeah. Jalili, this this younger French guitarist, he mentioned the same exact thing about. BB King and and like giant steps <laughs> for real. <laughs> so it's a it's a thing, but it's still thing. saying he's a master, you know. Right, and uh, well, I mean, it's 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 obvious. That's an obvious one. It was you know, it's like that's like a you know low hanging fruit, you know. Right. So, uh, um, but um, <clears throat> so anyway, the first for me is you know, it's always Jimi Hendrix. Um, because you got to remember, with him, it wasn't just the guitar. It was also the, the writing, the production, the stage presence. The, the, you know, it was like the whole everything. His lyrics, you know what I mean, were, were, were amazing, you know, because he was like really influenced by like Bob Dylan and, and that whole uh sort of uh um singer songwriter movement in the 60s you know um of course he had great lineage of of working with like little richard and the icy brothers to give him that that whole thing <clears throat> and then he you know look there's a lot of guys you know, you could be a master and not be an innovator, also. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really great, like for instance, and you know, some people are going to take issue with this, but you know, what do I care? Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan is a master. He is a master at the guitar and, and an incredible, incredible musician and an incredible storyteller not an innovator in my opinion you know that would the innovators were were you know hendrix and and buddy guy and uh and uh frank uh, zappa well well no i mean i'm talking about in in relationship to uh to stevie ray vaughn oh, okay okay it was like yes. hendrix hendrix buddy guy and then and of course uh albert king right you know uh, um, Bobby Blue Bland, that was kind of, you know, uh, uh, you can hear that in his voice when he sings and stuff. Great singer, too. That, you know, let's, I think Stevie Ray Vaughan's a great singer, you know, but not, in, but not an innovator. Whereas you take someone like Hendrix, the guy was a, a completely, all the rules changed on, on guitar after that, you know. Um, same thing with Wes Montgomery, you know, same thing with Alan Holdsworth. You know, these guys are, they're, they're innovators, you know, they, they're, they, Eddie Van Halen, you know, um, they, 
they created something new. There's a lot of them, you know. But um, for me, the you know the greatest master improvisers are you know the, the usual suspects. You know, John Coltrane, um, McCoy Tyner. Um, I just uh, Bill Evans, piano player, or Bill Evans, sax player, actually. <laughs> But, uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, you know, you'd have to go on each instrument, man. You know, Billy Cobham, Tony Williams. You know, these are uh, these guys are just. Yeah, you know, I mean, they're you could I could go down each instrument, you know, and uh, uh, Paul Chambers on the on the uh, acoustic bass and. And uh, Jaco Pastorius, you know, and Marcus Miller, and uh, Larry Graham, you know, electric bass, you know, and I'm, you know, there's, you could go on forever. <laughs> See what I mean? I would need like a thousand. You'd have to give me a list that I could have a thousand, so I could at least do like a hundred for each instrument. All right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because because it's. Uh, you know, that might have been different if you had asked me this question uh, in the late 60s. But now, it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's almost what is it, like 50 years later. You know, so there's, um, there's been a lot of development, certainly in, in, the, in terms of electric guitar. You know, yeah. although nobody, still nothing sounds, nobody makes a Strat quite sound as good as Hendrix, you know, like especially on his studio recordings where he was so um, uh, myopic, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to find the right sound. Hmm. I didn't imagine that he would be that way, really. Huh? I, I didn't imagine that he would be that way, really, but I guess I just haven't paid attention okay. to his recording it process. A, it took him a year to make Electric Lady, man. Because he was constantly, you know, matter of fact, guys were like, like, you know, quitting the band and stuff because they were just, <laughs> just tired of being in the studio. Oh, man. You know? <laughs> That's hilarious. <clears throat> well, I have another question for you, specific for you, because uh, you're a very good person at this and um, one thing I want to say is, uh, I actually asked, I asked, I asked Sid the other day too, because uh, he's also really good at this, but, um, but, but I want to know, what do you have to tell people about bringing the music to life and really allowing it to live? Because I, because it's like, you know, even at school, we can, just like you said, some, you said some earlier, just about like, like BB King, like having knowledge and not using it in a way. Sometimes we can not be, you know, too lost in our knowledge and, and just squeezing the life out of music and it's just totally lifeless and dead. Yeah. And it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Right. So that's kind of a trap, you know, that one could fall into, but you're really good at bringing that music to life and really giving it life. And um, so it's like within two ways. So what do you have to say about that and advice about bringing music to life? And within that same thing, uh, kind of because like the way that you say it is like, I remember you said many times, you know, you're like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get out of myself. Like I'm trying to get out of this universe. Like I'm right. trying to go somewhere else. Well, you know what I actually say, what, I try to not exist. <laughs> That's what I, I don't want to be a part of, you know, I don't want my little uh, ego and insecurities and, and stuff to be, to have anything to do with it, you know? So I need to get that out of the way. You know, so yeah, that's exactly right. But uh, w so was that the second part of your question? It is. It's, it's, I think it's kind of the same thing, bringing it to life. I feel like it's a similar. It's kind of in the same. Yeah. Way, okay. But. Well, the, the the thing is about bringing music to life. Obviously, is that there's there's there are external uh, stimuli that you have to deal with, which is like you know the other people you're playing with. So you got so n that notwithstanding. Um, uh, the simple answer for me is to make sure that I am 
prepared so far beyond what I need to be able to uh, to to perform that piece of music correctly. You know, when I say correctly, I know it was play all the notes right and the dynamics and the, I know how the shape of the song is. I know everything that I need to know about it so that when I'm playing it or, or whatever piece of music, I'm not concerned with anything, not the names of the chords or the, or, you know, what's, you know, uh, anything but I, when I, I say an intimate knowledge I'm talking about I know you know as much as possible of like what what the keyboard part is what the uh, uh, what the bass part is what the drum part is of course that's all flexible and like I said that's the external stimulus that you you know that's a, a, a slightly different part of the uh, equation but so when I go there now to play the song I'm just, I have this incredible uh, feeling of freedom as opposed to uh, fear. So it's all about freedom and fear, you know? In other words, if I feel the freedom, then I'm just waiting for my, the muse. You know how people say this stuff like, oh man, I had a bad night, or tonight was great. I, I never, I don't really even understand it. You know, every day is what it is. You know, like there's, a, there's, that's what you, that's how you felt today. That's what you, that's what you did today. That's all it is. You know, it's nothing more, nothing less. You know, so, uh, so anyway. when you oftentimes you know, I'll, I'll be playing and uh, uh, I start something just with a note you know I think a lot of times it, it, one of the best ways to do uh, to sort of find your path uh, the you know the path to to uh, sort of uh, more pure creativity is to be patient as opposed to, you know, rushing out. Oh, now, don't get me wrong, sometimes you feel like, like I said, if you really know the piece of music that well, then you're just doing what, what you're imagining should come next, you know? So that might be like a, a bull in a china factory you know what i mean it, it, it might be that you know um uh, but of course if you do something like that you you've set a bar you know kind of for for what that story has to be in terms of uh, uh energy and technique that you have to be able to live up to and that's what I'm talking about. Is that if you're if you're uh, over prepared, then whatever it is that you're imagining, you're capable of manifesting it in real time. So I'm, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that's the uh, that's that's my uh, focus. You know. It, and like I say, my focus is to not actually have any focus, is to just go away and <laughs> and let let the music be the let the notes and the and the, the external stimulus be be everything. Mm -hmm. You know, not not you know uh, uh, worrying about whether the drummer thinks I'm any good or whether the the girl in the third row you know likes my playing you know now, I'm not saying that you should that that uh, that you should ignore an audience that's not what I'm saying because the audience is there for it for me they're there for one reason so that I can steal their energy that's it I'm there I'm you are there for me to just vampire you. 
you know? <laughs> and because that way I can, I can, I can give it back, you know? So it's like this, it's one of those things that kind of helps you. It's like a, a launching pad. So it's not like I'm focused on the audience. I'm just aware of sort of positive energy coming to me, you know? And I'm aware of it and I'm allowing it to, to come in. And I'm trying to just completely drain the audience of every piece of energy they have. So, because I, I, I don't have enough uh, yeah. to do what I'm trying to do. You know what I mean? On my own, you know? At a, at a gig, I need, you know, any anybody who's seen me play knows that I, I it's, you know, I, I, I just couldn't do that you know, on my own. <laughs> but, right. uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, having said that, I'm, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not focused on it. It's just, I'm aware of it, you know, and I'm, and I, and I'm allowing that energy transference to sort of be a loop, you know, um, so I think that's an, another important element, you know, um, and, and that that can exist even when you're just playing in a rehearsal with the band because you you got the, the people you're playing with or your audience, you know, or or they're they're giving you energy, and it's that's if if you're <clears throat> an open vessel, it's so easy to recognize that because you can hear the way someone's playing, you can hear empathy. It doesn't mean that they're copying you or anything like that. It's just, you can feel this sort of uh, subjective empathy. And, uh, you know, it's obviously very helpful and contagious and it does that kind of thing that you might have experienced yourself when playing with a group where the sum of the music is greater than the than the parts you know like where you uh <clears throat> like this is magic it's magic right now and of course if you focus on that it goes away because that's because now you're not thinking about the music you're thinking about how nice the music sounds you know what i mean and that's like it's too dangerous you know we're too fragile our egos are just way too because then you start thinking wow i sound great you know and that's it and then the <laughs> then the chain is broken and you gotta start all over again you know so that's my uh two cents on that <laughs> that's awesome oh yeah that's awesome one thing I, I do pretty much every one of my rehearsals is i just close my eyes and try to not think of anything individual like just like you said hear the sum and just be in that thing whatever it is yeah just... i tell people who like to yeah, i tell people like don't play like you're you know like you're a guitar player play like you're their producer yeah that's you know good. so you're hearing it like you're you're over here somewhere hearing the whole thing and you're just one of the things yeah that's in there you're not the thing right you know <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I'll be the shaker all day, man. I love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. All right, cool, Dean. Well, hey, last question is just simply, um, what? And you've already said a lot, so many great things. But what um, closing advice would you have to any musicians um, who are just in it for the long haul? The people who are dedicated to a life of mastery, or at least a life of music, you know? Yeah, I would say. Um... Obviously, there's two, you know, there's two things that, that are important. One is that uh, is that you don't be discouraged because of some monetary thing. That's not what music is. Nobody that plays really great um, became great because they wanted to be rich. You know what I mean? But that might have changed at some point in their lives where they said you know what i could make a lot of money doing this you know if i do this and i do that you know sort of business decisions right but um you know 
if you want to be, if you, you know, if you, when you first get into the business, not the business, when you first get into the discipline of being a musician, you owe it, you owe everything to the, to being as good as you can be as a musician. So you just um, don't be too discouraged if you're not making a lot of money right away because um, anytime you get distracted and like make, maybe take some gig with some crappy band, you know, just to just to make ends meet. Um, that's taking all your time away from you maybe playing with this other band that's like way more creative and better, you know? Um, and also taking a lot of time away from you just honing your craft. Because a lot of times, man, and this happens to a lot of people, I know when I was, uh, you know, uh, when I first got out of college, you know, I. I, want, I like to eat too, and you know, and, you know, on a, like a regular like basis, like at least once or twice a week would be good. You know, when I'm when you're young, you know, um, I'm kidding. I mean, obviously you need to eat, right? Um, but uh, um, the thing is, is that you can. You're, you're capable of uh, dealing with that a lot better when you're young, you know? So um, my recommendation is always to try to just be a, uh, a, good, a, a good student all the time and, and just make sure that, you're, you know, that you're, you're doing your best, you know, uh, to, uh, so that when you do play in, in in, in whatever situations that you're given, um, that uh, that those that you can make the most of them, and those situations will make it so that you can earn more money, and and be, you know because you'll because people will uh, and uh, a very wise uh, musician told me something um, that was very valuable in terms of the business angle to music. And that was, he said, you're worth what you can get. And so in other words, uh, you shouldn't feel bad about, you know, wow, I, you know, this guy's paying me a mint for what I'm doing. And, and this is not that hard because uh, it's like that, that uh, I, I remember hearing a story of, uh, um, about uh, Pablo Picasso, um, where he was eating dinner and, and some fan recognized him, came up to him and uh, said, "Oh, you know, you know, can I get your autograph?" You know, and uh, so he said, "Sure," and he wrote his autograph on his napkin, paper napkin or something. And they said, "Oh, could you just draw a little something, do a little, little something on there?" And so he goes. And he draws something on there and, and then he hands it and says, that'll be 500 bucks. And uh, well, she goes, but, but that only took you like two seconds to do it. He goes, no, 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 that took me 60 years. Yeah. You know, so, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, don't, so you're worth what you can get, you know? <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Awesome, Dean. Well, thank you so much. So everybody who's listening, uh, be sure, you know, probably you already know uh, Dean's stuff, but be sure to check out, you know, his latest albums. He's been playing a lot and he's got some really amazing music. Check Spotify, his website, buy his albums. He's also offering lessons online. You can learn from the master yourself and uh, you definitely want to do that. So hit him up for online lessons. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for now. Yeah, well, that, that was, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I mean, I hope I didn't bogart the whole uh, the whole experience here for you, you know. But uh, I was thanks so much for your you know, interesting questions. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. Much appreciation. Sorry, man. <laughs>